the workshop uh, on class meters vehicles for antimicrobial resistance. Um, uh, welcome to ICTP, even though virtually. And uh, so this workshop is a uh, history started. Uh, we meant to have it just when COVID started, but now finally we managed to have it at least uh, virtually. So I just leave the word uh, to Alice, who has been the main driver behind uh, this workshop. Alice. Ah, thank you, Matteo, for everything really and making this possible. Uh, so, I uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for applying. I'm overwhelmed from the reaction, really. I didn't expect, uh, I mean, I wished so much, um, so many people, but I didn't expect it was so. Um, well, welcomed. Uh, I have to tell you a couple of things, uh, uh, housekeeping things. So, all the talks for the speakers, all the talks will be recorded, unless you say so. So, if you want to say so, please do say so and uh, for the schedule today we are not having there are some modifications with respect to the advertised schedule and in particularly uh, Rohan Meta cannot speak today we will try to reschedule him later in the week but uh, we are still discussing when he can speak so I will let you know and everything will be posted in the website and uh, yes, I think it's all. And so I leave it to Zam. I know, and I want to thank uh, Matteo for being the local organizer and believing in this, and uh, Zam and Fernando, who are the other two organizers who believed in this and uh, helped me a lot to try to figure out how to do this. And of course, we have to acknowledge the founding, which is Imperial. Um, uh, GDA, MRC GDA Center at Imperial and ICTP. Uh, and that's it, Zam. Back to you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the beginning of the week. Um, I am going to talk. Let me just see if I can share my screen successfully. That looks good. Let's go over here. Alicia, can you see that? Great, thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Um, uh, I think I should say straight away that um, uh, I've been given a mission uh, of giving you a very, very gentle introduction. Uh, this is going to be very gentle. So I, I think any of you who are real experts uh, at analyzing plasma genomes or anything like that, um, feel free to go and get a coffee and come back in half an hour. Um, but this is, we're expecting quite a wide audience. So what I'm doing is just a broad introduction to what we might see in bacterial and plasmid genomes and what happens when we try and assemble them. Um, okay, here we go. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what bacterial genomes look like and how they evolved. A little bit about plasmid genomes. Um, uh, I am gonna talk about um, how genome assembly um, does and doesn't work. I'm going to do this in a very, very high level way. I'm not going to talk to you about any algorithms or how that or, or that kind of stuff because we don't have time and that's not really the mission of this talk. Um, I'll talk about long, how long weeds make things easier um, and very briefly about what kind of things might go wrong. Um, okay, so if we start with bacterial genomes. Um, so bacterial genomes are maybe a few megabyte bases in size. Um, they're haploid, so they've got one uh, that, um, you've only got one copy of um, uh, of the genome from from the parent, um, and genes cover sort of eighty five to ninety percent of bacterial genomes. So they're quite gene rich compared to say humans. Um, so you can actually use shared gene content, um, both to tell you how many genes are shared, but also uh, how much genome is shared because most of the genome is covered by genes. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, roughly speaking, um, the average shared sequence between two bacterial genomes can be quite low, even within a single species. So two E. coli may share a, which have this, a, quite a big window here between 30 and 70% of their genes. That really depends you know, how, they, uh, how those two samples have been selected. Um, 
and that's that's that was quite a shock uh, when this was first um, seen. Uh, so for comparison, if I asked um, what proportion of genome is shared between me and one of you, then it would be over 99%. So the genomes are structurally basically the same within humans compared to bacteria where even within a species, huge amounts of DNA can be discarded and added. Um, so when you think about, when, when you look at what that means for gene sharing across um, genomes within a species, I uh, hope you can see, I hope my window with um, showing all of you is not covering up the picture. There we go. Um, so here, what I've got on the x-axis is uh, what I'm plotting simultaneously is um, how many, in a, in a set of 10 genomes of, of uh, six different species, um, what's the frequency of the different genes within them? So in other words, in all of these species, most of the genes are either rare on the left, so they're only there in one sample, or they're very common, they're there in all of them. And there's a relatively few genomes in the middle, which are there in 50% of your, of your genomes. So what that means is, um, if you want to compare a lot, of, a, a lot of genomes of a given species, there are some genes, and in other words, some proportion of the genome, which is shared by everybody. But there's also a huge amount of stuff over here on the left, which is really rare. And those, those things that are on the left hand side are um, typically things that are transiently in the population. They're maybe brought in by mobile elements. So they arrive in a particular, um, in one particular genome. And they don't hang around in the population very long. They may drop out again. And there's some continual turnover. And if they do, add some selective advantage, then you would expect to see them move up in frequency over time. Oops. So how do genetic changes occur? Well, they can occur in a couple of ways. They might occur intrinsically. In other words, um, they might happen during the process of replication. So during replication, you might get a single base change, a SNP, um, and that would be inherited by the children. Uh, so we talk about this being vertical inheritance. Or you can have um, genetic changes which occur through contact with unrelated individuals. So DNA material is transferred from one cell to an another unrelated cell, and then either incorporated into the genome, into the chromosome, or it becomes a, a plasmid or something else, uh, which is sort of hitchhiking along. And these, um, because of the way that these things move, they can arrive in um, disappear in blocks. So this is a picture from a paper by Eduardo Rocher and uh, Marie Touchon et al. Um, and all of these, all of these things I'm showing here, each of these rows is a is a chunk of genome, all taken from the same place in the E. coli genome. So it's a what we call a insertion hotspot. And uh, each of these coloured blocks is a set is a different set of genes. So you can see, for example, I hope you can see my mouse. Um, you can see um, shared blocks across many genomes, but they're all um, arranged in different, um, they're all arranged differently. So we've got a, a mosaic of blocks of genes, um, all of these sort of occurring at about the same position in the genome. So when we compare bacterial genomes, um, how we do it depends on what we're trying to achieve. Um, so the, the, the prototypical thing you might do if you're looking within a species, is you might want to track the spread of something. So what I've got here is a picture from uh, a classic paper from 2013, I think, from Simon Harris et al. Um, and what they wanted to do was track the spread of MRSA through uh, a neonatal ward in Cambridge. Um, and what they did is they collected samples from babies and mothers and staff. And by comparing the genomes of these guys, they, they, they managed to infer something about how the, how the bacteria was spreading. And when they do that, they needed to decide that they used the implicit information that genomes that are very similar are, are closely related, and there hasn't been time for mutation to occur, and things that are further apart have, have had more time for more mutations. So um, the, the immediate question that occurs after that is to ask how this makes sense. So I've just told you that um, two E. coli might share only 30% of their genome. 
so um what does what does how do i how do i make that make sense at the same time as drawing trees so the tree model makes sense when mostly the genome stays the same except for mutations or at least it's a model that only incorporates the mutations um and that we know that's not really how bacterial genomes evolve if we wanted to incorporate everything into our model but if you were to restrict to the core genome so that's the bit of the genome that's shared amongst all of the samples that you're studying then if you just restrict there and just look at the SNPs then a tree is a perfectly good model for understanding those relationships and um, even more if we think about the cells from which these genomes came because cells come from binary fission of a, of a, of a mother into two, two daughters there is a real cellular tree which represents the relationships of all the cells and their ancestors going back to an ancestor a common ancestor so there is a cellular tree but the point is that the the genomes don't precisely reflect that cellular tree precisely because they're passing dna backwards and forwards so what does that mean what about the rest of the tree so if i've got three bacteria here called alice bob and charlotte and um uh, they're all quite closely related compared to the rest of their population they all have these red mutations but then this gray mutation on the left happened on the way to Alice and only Alice has it. These two mutations happen on the way to Bob and only Bob has both and Charlotte has the first one of these. So that's how they, that is a, is a representation of their relatedness. So when we use tree-based approaches, we're saying that the relatedness is about which SNPs you do and don't share. So Alice, Bob and Charlotte all share the red SNPs. Only Alice has this. Charlotte has only this and Bob has both of these. So that's fine. The question is what happens when um, some ancestor of Bob and Charlotte, but not an ancestor of Alice as well, some, somebody back here passed some DNA from, uh, from, uh, from, sorry, if an ancestor of Bob passed it to an ancestor of Charlotte, how would we represent that in the tree? Well, we couldn't because it's non-tree-like behavior. We're passing stuff sort of sideways. Um, and if then that gene then developed a SNP, it's absolutely there's absolutely no way we can represent that. So there's some there's a mutation here hanging off on the side in a gene that moved from Bob's ancestor to Charlotte's ancestor. And and we've got that SNP is sort of outside our universe. It's not doesn't fit into our model. So where do we go? I mean, where we go really depends on uh, what we're trying to achieve um most of the time uh well for many questions what you want to do um for many questions standard phylogenetics provides uh what you need um and so here i've got um a set of bacteria related by a tree looking at the SNPs in their core genome and on the right this is a representation at what's called a fandango representation uh which shows um other um, accessory genes and who has them and who don't, who doesn't. So for example, this gene here, um, there's, there should be a label up here. This gene here is shared by all of these bacteria, but not this one and not this one. This blue gene is here only in this sample, as is this one. And so you basically combine a vertical representation, a tree representation of the, of the genome um, that everybody shares with some kind of heat map showing for, for the other genes that not everyone shares, who doesn't doesn't have it um and you'll find um you'll find many papers use this kind of representation for example to show um the relatedness of strains and then which ones have amr genes or which ones have plasmids and then not really the subject of this week if you wanted to do a genotype phenotype analysis and you wanted to draw correlations between phenotypes and genotypes then you probably want to be aware of all of the genetic changes, not just the SNPs, because if huge chunks of DNA are missing, then they make, make a difference to the phenotype. Um, and so these days, you, there are about three approaches you can use. You can use KMAS, you shred the genome into words, and you just do independent associations for each word to see which genomes they're in, and to see if there are any words that are signifiers for, that are highly correlated with whatever your phenotype is. So there are, um, 
I guess the, the state of the art are two tools called Bugwas and Pisia for that. Um, the trouble with that, with breaking the genome up into tiny words, is, is there are a lot of words if you break up the genome into tiny pieces, and lots of them are totally correlated with each other. So you end up um, multiply testing things. So a, this, a unitig approach is a way of sort of collecting together blocks of words that always coexist. Um, and there are approaches for trying that. There's one called DBGWAS. Uh, which is an acronym which I won't go into for now. And there are other approaches called genome graphs, which try and represent the, the entirety of the variation that you have inside a species. And you can use them as an infrastructure for doing these kind of things. So, okay, what, that's bacteria. What about plasmids? So these are independently replicating elements in the cell. They're separate from chromosomes. You may have uh, a, a given bacterial cell may have either no plasmids or up to maybe 10. I think 11 is the biggest I've heard of. Um, and each one might be at a copy number of somewhere between one and 100. So generally speaking, small plasmids tend to be at higher copy numbers. So you have more copies of them in the cell and larger plasmids, which might be hundreds of kilobases long, um, will tend to be at a lower copy number. Um, and these can be, you can think of these as selfish or parasitic or commensal, it depends, um, depends on your perspective and on the example. Um, but they do often have the ability to independently move to other cells and carrying genetic cargo, um, which is you know, a subject of most of this week because that cargo can often be uh, genes which convey the ability to not be killed by, by antibiotics. And these can move within species, they can move across species, and they can even move across phyla. They can move a long way. Um, Okay, so all of that, all of everything I've said so far is about uh, how bacterial and plasmid genomes exist and how they're related. Um, I haven't talked about how you infer those genomes from sequencing data. So what's genome assembly? So you've got a genome which is unknown. Sequencing data means what that means is you've taken the genome, you've broken it up into chunks and you've redundantly um, read or measured or seen those chunks and given these chunks uh, you try and reconstruct the, the genome from which they uh, from which they come so an assembly is a hypothesis of a genome it's a it's it's you have a model and you say under this model this is what I think the assembly is quite often genome assembly tools are um, and I speak as someone who's written one but I'm, but bluntly that um, they often have beautiful ideas and some ugly heuristics underneath, um, especially if you're doing short read assembly. Um, so um, I think that, here, where have I got? Here we go. So if you're using short reads, so Illumina breaks, uh, Illumina data breaks your genome up into somewhere between 75 and 250 base pair chunks. Um, and your genome is a few million base pairs long. Um, and often contains repeat elements. So if you have a repeat, say if you have um, some kind of mobile element that's copied and pasted itself many times in the genome, um, and you break your genome up into chunks that are smaller than that repeated copy, then it's fundamentally impossible to reconstruct the genome. It really is completely impossible to reconstruct the genome. Um, so what happens is you end up with tens or hundreds of contigs blocks of genome. and um, depending on what you're doing, that may be good enough for what you're trying to achieve. But plasmid reconstruction is particularly hard from short reads, uh, in particular because mobile elements can be shared between plasmids, plasmids can recombine or do crazy things stimulated by those mobile elements, and you can have shared things between the plasmids and the chromosome. So plasmid reconstruction is hard. Inference of presence of a known plasmid, given the sequence data, is a bit easier because you know what you're looking for. However, things changed, I guess, five years ago or six years ago, whenever Oxford Nanopore came on the scene and Pat Bio was already on the scene, of course, by then. So with long reads um, where you've broken the genome up, genome up into chunks of, say, a thousand bases or a hundred thousand bases, you can reconstruct the full genome as a single contig and full plasmids. Um, that is possible. It's not definitely going to happen. It's not guaranteed. Um, but it, and it still requires, I think, at some level, some luck and some careful checking. But 
waving my hands, maybe it works 30% of the time, 50% of the time. It depends on your sample prep and how long reads you've managed to achieve. And the reads you can manage to get really depends on, on how you've prepared the DNA and the, how long the chunks are at the point when you put it into the sequencing machine. So complicated things can still happen. Um, I'm going to finish with just a single example of, of crazy things. Um, there was an outbreak um, in a hospital in Virginia in the USA. Um, and from 2000, 2000, sorry, from 2007 to 2012, um, they found many patients were infected by organisms which had carried the KPC uh, um, carbapenemase. Um, and so there's a study, there's a very interesting study where they took 204 patients and 281 isolates from those patients. And all of them contained this gene, KPC, but it was one gene carried by 13 species. So, you know, the first question you ask if you're doing genomic, epi genomic epidemiology um, in a hospital is, you know, is this a clonal outbreak? Meaning, is this a single strain of a bacteria that is suddenly becoming very successful and spreading? And the answer is obviously no, because we've got 13 different species here. So it's not one strain of something that's suddenly taking off. Um, so the next question was, is it a plasmid outbreak? And they spent a long time trying to reconstruct these, uh, the plasmid genomes. Um, and um, what they actually found was that the, the KPC gene was being carried on a transposon. So that's a small mobile element that can copy paste itself. And um, that was sitting on plasmids. And in fact, um, so these are, I hope you can see this without this thing on the side blocking you. Um, there's some quite complicated relationships between the different plasmids. It wasn't, they weren't all the same. Um, you could see the transposon on multiple different plasmids, which were related in some cases, but less so in others. And actually what had happened was um, the gene was sitting inside one transposon, which was then nested inside another one. And these things were seen on multiple different plasmids in multiple different species. So they, they call this a Russian Dolt effect. So basically, you had a transposon outbreak jumping across plasmids, some of which were more or less successful than others. Um, and you had this nested mosaic structure of things that go on. Now, this, this kind of stuff presents a big challenge for um, assemblers because you have repeats that you really care about um, ca carried on multiple plasmids in the same cell potentially, and um, and in multiple samples that you're trying to compare. So um, I think it's still true that um, understanding plasmids from genomic data is, is often challenging. Um, there are lots of things we might want to ask about how they've evolved and how samples are related to each other when you've got a, a data set. Um, and I think you'll find a bunch of the talks this week cover this subject. I'm gonna stop talking here and I'll stop screen sharing. Okay, so I think I'm handing straight over to the next speaker. Uh, we we have a ten minute break. If anybody wants to take a, grab a coffee, and if anybody has uh, any questions, uh, comments, uh, things that want to know. By the way, Zam, it was a great talk. Really interesting. Uh, or you, ah, yes, the first thing I needed to tell you is that uh, put, uh, if you have any comments, questions, everything, put them in the chat and we, we will read them from the chat. Otherwise, we can have coffee or, because um, James is in another call and he will arrive straight at 40 past for his. Uh, 